So the scenario is this, you finally recorded that amazing take on your guitar. You played the last chord and waited patiently for it to disappear into silence, trying not to shuffle around in your chair and ruin that pristine recording. You hit stop and you celebrate, yes, finally. After 24 and a half takes, I did it. I captured that amazing performance, except you didn't. Because you hadn't hit record, you'd only hit play. Sound familiar? Does to me, I've done it a gazillion times. If you watch to the end of this video, I'm gonna make some suggestions for door manufacturers, which could mean that they could help us to avoid this awful situation and stop these amazing performances from being resigned to history. Hi folks, I'm Mike and I hope you're well. This is gonna be a confessions video of sorts because all of the mistakes I'm gonna talk about in this video are ones that I've definitely made myself. I'll make suggestions for solutions where I can. Now, one time I didn't make a mistake was when I signed up for DistroKid to release my music. If you would like to do that as well, follow the VIP link in the description down below and you'll get 7% off of their already incredible price. Now let's dive in to these mistakes. A wise man once said to me, if in doubt, blame others. Or was that just the voice in my head? I'd love to apply that to microphone manufacturers because there's been a few occasions when I've been singing into a microphone and thinking, why can't I get the sound right on this microphone? It sounded fine last week when I used it last, but this week it sounds just muffled and muddy and yak only to find that I've been singing into the wrong side of the microphone. For those of you who don't know, with condenser microphones, there is a right and a wrong way to sing into them if they're using something called the cardioid pattern, where the microphone just picks up in front. Now, some manufacturers like Rode, for example, with this NT1A will put a marking on there. Great microphone, by the way. This has got a little sort of gold button on the front of it, which indicates the front. And I don't think I've ever made this mistake take with this microphone. Let's move on to the AKG C414, an absolutely legendary microphone. I will put a link for this in the description. This is not a cheap microphone, but it is awesome. See that lovely gold front? Completely different to the back. I've never made this mistake with this microphone. Moving on from there, if we look at Audio-Technica microphones, this one's the AT2020. It's not such a great scenario. You can see there's some little bits of writing on there and the front is indicated with their company logo. But you know, look, if your eyesight's not great like mine, then you could easily miss that. I do think I've made this mistake with this microphone on a couple of occasions. And now to the worst case scenario, I reviewed this microphone last year. It's an amazing microphone, sounds wonderful. Now it's from a company called Nude, okay? And true to their company name, there is no marking on this microphone whatsoever. No logo, no model number, no little button or anything like that. Um, this one's really a problem. You have to use your ears, I guess. So look, I'd like to see all microphone manufacturers put at least something on there. If you've ever made that mistake, let me know in the comments down below. In a moment, I'm gonna be discussing what I think is the most embarrassing mistake of all of these. And if you've ever committed it like I have, it can make you question your whole abilities in terms of mixing music. It's not surprising we do make these mistakes because after all, it's kind of a complex process, all of this, a bit like sharing all of those links to the various different places you've released your music to. Thankfully, the sponsor for this video does have a solution for that. This is the hyperfollow page for one of my EPs, Wonderland. When people visit this web page, they can choose for themselves which one of these great platforms they want to listen to my music on. But I didn't have to create this page. It was generated automatically for me when I uploaded my EP to DistroKid. If we visit my DistroKid page here and look at this EP and scroll down, you can see the section just at the bottom here where they supply the link for me to share. Now I can share that on places like Facebook where they will automatically be generated my album artwork and people can just click on this and go straight to that hyperlink page. Now this is all included with the base price of DistroKid which is just $19.99 per year. If you follow the link 
link in the description, you'll get 7% off of that already great price. This mistake is by far the most embarrassing of all. And I'm afraid to say I have been guilty of this on several occasions. It happens during the mixing process. You've perhaps got your favorite EQ plugin open. You've been adjusting it, tweaking it, getting it just right so that that track now finally sounds as it should, only to find you actually had that plugin bypassed and you haven't been adjusting anything at all. Now this mistake can take other forms. You may have been pushing that fader up and down just so that you can get that guitar to sit just right in the mix and you think, yeah, finally, I nailed it, only to find you're actually pushing the wrong fader. I think this mistake speaks to the strong connection between what we're seeing visually and what we think we are hearing. And it should tell us to make sure that we do, in fact, use our ears and not our eyes when we're mixing. Now, the most important thing about this mistake, above all, if you ever commit it, don't admit to anyone that you've done it. Do so before we move on to the final heartbreaking mistake which I have made in the past, I want to offer a couple of solutions for the first mistake we talked about. You know the one where you hit record or you thought you hit record, but you only hit play. Now these solutions are suggestions for door makers, okay? The likes of Avid, Steinberg, Bandlab, Presonus, etc. Sorry if I left your one out. So if you work for one of those companies, pay attention. The first suggestion I want to make occurred to me the other day when I was using this, my GoPro. GoPro has a feature where if you hit record, it will actually include some material from the time before you hit record, yeah, which suggests that there is a buffer in here. It's actually always recording, yeah, so it's even recording when you haven't hit record. And that got me thinking, could this be used indoors? Perhaps there could be an option where even if you just have the track armed for recording, it's actually recording even when you hit play. Yeah. So when you hit stop, you do have the option to retrieve that sort of recording. Okay. That's just one suggestion. I realize that could be heavy for some people in terms of system resources. Definitely it would be an option. Now my second suggestion, you can let me know in the comments down below folks, which one of these you think is best. My second solution would just be to have a voice announcement as an option, a kind of an Alexa style voice, if you like, so that when you hit play, it says playing. And then when you hit record, it says record in a better voice than that, of course, not using my voice. As I say, an Alexa style voice. I think that may just be enough to remind us about what we're actually doing. As I say, let me know in the comments down below. This next one though is heartbreaking. This final mistake is absolutely heartbreaking if it happens to you. And it's definitely happened to me in the past, but I do have a workflow now to avoid it. It comes in many different forms, but it generally surrounds the topic of saving or not. Now it may be in its most simple form that you've been working on a track for several hours. You didn't have the auto save feature switched on. You have a sudden computer crash and poof, all of your work is gone. You may find yourself swearing a little bit if this happens. Now, another thing that can happen with saving is you do actually save, but you save over a perfectly good version of your file with a not so good version. Perhaps you've done some things which weren't that great, yeah? And you've just saved to the same file, okay? Not good when that happens because once you switch your door off, there's no ability to undo and get back to your old work. Now, as I have mentioned, I have been working in a different way for several years now, which has actually avoided this. And what I do is I do save many different versions of my files. Now, some doors have auto versioning when they have auto saves. Okay. If you want to use those, it's fine. But I just want to tell you how I go about it. I do it manually and it's really helped me to avoid problems. So let's say my song is called I'm So Dumb. Yeah, that's my base file name. Now what I do is I prefix each version that I save with a number. Okay, typically it'll be like 01, I'm So Dumb. 02, 
I'm so dumb, zero three, I'm so dumb, etc. Why do I use zero one instead of just one? Yeah, that just helps to keep it perfectly in order when you're using either Mac or Windows and you're sorting your folders by file name. Okay, if you just use one, it can end up sort of ahead or past say something which is numbered as nine for example so that's why why i do it like that so it's good for a hundred different versions if you want to if you think you're going to go over a hundred different versions then you may want to do zero zero one or zero zero two etc i don't think i've ever had that happen okay so that would be the sort of base file names for my versions now i append each of these file names with something to indicate what I achieved or what I was doing with that version. So it may be 01, I'm so dumb, setup. 02, I'm so dumb, guitar. 03, I'm so dumb, vocal, etc., etc. Now, I've just got into the habit of doing this, okay? So so I, I saved quite often. As soon as I've achieved something sort of pretty significant, I will sort of save things like that there's two things about that which works really well it can help you as i say to avoid saving over things which were good and with most stores if you open up two projects which most of them you can i think you can actually copy and paste things from you know one to the other so if you kind of feel that there was something or a recording or something which you since recorded over i don't know something like that um, it can be handy to go back and grab things from old versions sometimes. Now, the other way which this can occur, and if it hasn't happened to you, it will happen to you, and you will wish you had taken my advice, is when you have hard drive failures. Now, you may think that you're using SSDs, yeah? There's nothing mechanical in them. They're not going to fail. I promise you SSDs do fail. I think last year or the year before, I had three fail in one year. And it would have been really catastrophic for me if I didn't already have a backup routine in place, okay? Now, just to give you a brief idea of what happens with my backup routine. All of my project files are checked for updates around about three or four times a day, yeah? And if they have been updated, the updated version is then saved to a NAS, which is in another room in my house. A NAS has got, you know, some big hard drives in there, big capacity, okay? I think it stands for Network... Network Area Storage? No, no it's not that. Somebody let me know in the comments what it actually stands for. Anyway... So that's the first step. That automatically happens, okay? So it's saved off to those nice big hard drives, which, by the way, have redundancy. What do I mean by that? They have copies of each other. So even if one of the hard drives fails in that NAS, there's a backup, okay, on the other one. Now, what if my house burns down? Please don't touch wood. That would be a problem. Everything would be gone, yeah? So I could give those to, you know, a relative or something, you know, do backups. That's too much manual intervention for me. I will forget to do that. So what I have is I also have it automatically backed up once or twice a day to cloud storage, okay? So I don't have to think about any of this. It all happens automatically for me. It's not saving everything, you know, the whole folder every time. It's only updating with new things. Now, if you want to watch the video I made about that in a lot more detail, including um, the NAS, which I actually use, which is just wonderful, then watch this video right here. I explain the whole process it's just given me so much peace of mind. And I have had one hard drive failure on my computer since then. And everything was retrievable.